I am going to be gone. Uh, I have some doctor appointments and my kids have some doctor appointments that I need to go to today. So you're going to have a lecture by uh, video today. You need to pay attention because you will have to actually know this stuff. So don't just ignore it because it's a video and I'm not physically there. Make sure you're nice to the sub and you're extra respectful. Now, at the end of the presentation today, we are going to read a chapter about ozone and or a section in the chapter about ozone and then you're also going to have a writing prompt on ozone and on the atmospheric layers that you will be able to use your notes from today on so make sure you're taking notes so you can use those notes to help you all right let's go ahead and get started all right so the earth is made up of layers we all know this um, the most dense layers are in the center of the earth and that is because things that are more compacted, things that are more dense, actually have a stronger gravitational pull. So as the earth was molten and started forming, we had those most dense layers form in the core while our less dense layers are on the outside. But the earth isn't the only thing that has layers, our ocean has layers and so does our atmosphere. Now here we're looking at a side view of the Earth pretty darn close up and even from this image you can kind of tell that the atmosphere is not very thick. The white stuff you're seeing is not snow but is instead clouds. That is what the top of what we call the troposphere. The troposphere is where we are at. Sometimes people like to pronounce it the tropic sphere because it's where the tropics are. Uh, it's down where islands are and land is and mountains. Here's another shot uh, further out of the atmosphere. You can see the top of the troposphere here. Uh, looks like my mouse pointer is not working. Sorry, it looks like I'm going to have to do this. Uh, here, <laughs> that is like the worst drawing I've ever done. Um, where you can see uh, cumulonimbus clouds that have risen higher and higher up in the troposphere and then been cut off by the higher winds that exist in the stratosphere above it. Now looking at this, you can see a very, very thin layer of blue. That is not our entire atmosphere. That does show us about the top of the troposphere. It starts to be less and less blue with less and less water vapor. Water vapor is the gas in the atmosphere that helps us to actually see the sky. So water vapor scatters blue light. So as the white light comes in, it bumps around the blue light until it eventually becomes absorbed and come back down to earth as well. But blue, blue light tends to take a little bit longer to get to the surface. Now, most of the molecules in the atmosphere are completely blind to light. So when we're looking at this thin layer, about three times the thickness of this blue area we see is where the atmosphere actually stops. So our atmosphere actually stops about where it says the word compared there, right above the Earth. Oops, sorry. Okay, so the atmosphere is made up of layers. Get this written down. Remember, blue you write. The lowest atmospheric layer is where we hang out. It's where all mountains are, it's where all life exists, and it's where most of the oxygen in the entire atmosphere is. Any higher than this and you can't breathe. Even in the middle of the troposphere, you can't breathe because there's not enough oxygen for you. The troposphere, next followed by the stratosphere, the mesosphere, the thermosphere, which is technically the um, hottest layer of the Earth, and the exosphere. Now remember, the mesosphere is, meso means middle. There's actually a mesosphere in the Earth. Remember, we have the lithosphere, we have the asthenosphere, the mesosphere, then the outer and inner core. Well, in the atmosphere, we also have something called the mesosphere, and that is the middle layer of the atmosphere. Now at any time, um, that I'm going too fast, make sure you guys pause so that you can actually write the notes because when I'm at home I tend to go a little bit faster. So in this diagram, and this diagram is actually in your notes, um, we're going to add in some things and I think you actually have to add them in on the right. 
So there's only a few things that we actually need to know about the atmospheric layers. And those are the thermosphere is where auroras occur. Auroras are the northern lights, or sometimes called the southern lights if you're in the southern hemisphere. And it's also where satellites orbit. So satellites, most satellites actually do not orbit in space. They actually just orbit inside of our own atmosphere. Now the space station, if you can see on this graph, right in between the thermosphere and the mesosphere is something called the mesopause. The mesopause is the location where the International Space Station orbits the Earth. So it orbits pretty close to home. All right, the mesosphere, again, the middle sphere, that's where shooting stars are going to burn up. That's where we're going to see those shooting stars. Now remember, shooting stars are not real stars. Uh, they're not stars at all. What they are is debris from space falling to Earth. Now, most debris that falls to Earth is in small chunks, but as it enters the atmosphere, because they're coming in at such high speeds, the air molecules will cause friction on the rock itself, which will cause it to heat up, and it will heat up rapidly. And that's why we see this display of light. It's the rock heating up so much that it's literally glowing. Now, the rocks break up in this um, layer of the atmosphere because there's finally enough molecules to cause enough friction for this to happen. It heats up rapidly, and the thermal expansion expands so rapidly that it expands faster than the bonds between the molecules can keep holding on. And so it will literally shatter and break the rock materials as it's coming into the mesosphere. So that's what a shooting star is. It's just basically a rock, no matter what size, asteroid, meteoroid, uh, space dust, that comes into our atmosphere and starts to glow. Now, some of them do make it to the ground. We obviously know that. I mean, there's not any dinosaurs, well, not many dinosaurs walking around anymore on the planet. And um, so the larger the rock, the less likely it's going to break up into small pieces and be pretty safe. But this is the zone where you start seeing that brilliant light. Now, the stratosphere... Stratosphere is important mostly in this class because it's where the ozone layer is, and the ozone layer is extraordinarily important for us. And the ozone is made up of three oxygen atoms. The oxygen we breathe is actually only made up of two oxygen atoms bonded together, and when we have, like, it's just oxygen, what is the difference, right? Uh, but when we have these different atoms bonded together, their electron configurations are different, and they behave like completely different chemicals. Now the troposphere is where all weather occurs. This is where the weather happens. And you saw in that, that picture, I'm gonna go back real quick. Really quick, without quickness. Um, right here, where we see, let me draw a picture again. Uh, right here where we see this cumulonimbus cloud. Sorry, I don't use this very often, so I'm not very good at it. Um, right there in the diagram, you can see a similar structure. Right here, this is where we have the cumulonimbus cloud, and here it tops off. Sometimes people call this an anvil cloud, because it looks like a flat anvil of which um, people would flatten swords on. So here, that signifies the top of the troposphere. Then we have a very big stratosphere, pretty moderate mesosphere, and thermosphere. So even the tallest mountains in the world do not get to the top of the troposphere. So the troposphere, again, is where all weather happens. Hurricanes, tornadoes, thunderstorms, all this stuff is going on in the troposphere. The stratosphere, again, is very important because it holds 90% of the world's ozone. Now, oxygen that you breathe is made up of two oxygen atoms. I just mentioned that just an, a second ago. So these circles represent the atom. The O signifies that it is oxygen. And here, they are bonded together. So this molecule is O2. This is the air you breathe. This is what keeps us alive. This is what keeps your cells functioning and your brain functioning as well. Ozone is made up of three oxygen molecules. And so ozone is actually 
O3. So here are these oxygen molecules, and not drawn to scale in the slightest, there are so many oxygen or ozone molecules in the small space that I've drawn this. These um, this setup, how these bonded compared to how the O2 molecule is bonded, causes a density difference between the oxygen molecules and the ozone molecules. Now, oxygen is pretty dense, so it hangs around where uh, plant life lives and where we live and gives us nice air to breathe so we don't die. But ozone, because of its density, it is a lot less dense than some of the other gases. So just by its natural density tendencies, just like wood floats on water, oxygen, not oxygen, sorry, ozone floats up in the atmosphere and forms a layer here in the ozone layer in the stratosphere. Now that's really important because the ozone layer here helps to block this UV radiation. Now remember UV stands for ultraviolet radiation. This radiation is bad for us and in fact without having an ozone layer to block or absorb this radiation, there wouldn't be much life, or if there was any life on land, there probably wouldn't be any life on land. Because of the fact that this stuff is such high energy, it will go in and destroy cells. If you were out in space and you were unexposed, you were exposed to the actual radiation that the sun gives off, it would blister your skin in minutes. You would get second degree burns very, very quickly. If you were exposed longer, you could end up having three degree burns and it would not be good. You would go blind as well. However, thankfully, we have this ozone layer that goes up and it traps this UV radiation, technically mostly UVB radiation, and absorbs it and re-radiates it as heat energy. Ozone is one of the very few molecules that actually absorbs light energy and turns it to heat. So the stratosphere holds on to 90% of the Earth's ozone. Now, ozone is a naturally occurring chemical. There's uh, radical ozone molecules floating around that get captured up by an oxygen molecule, and it will turn to ozone. Once it does it, it floats and makes its way up into the ozone layer, and there it lives a happy little life. It doesn't really have a life, uh, but if it did, it would live up there with all its buddies in the ozone layer. So ozone is an important gas that absorbs UV or ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Now, skin cancer, that's what's causing skin cancer. What happens is the UV radiation is intense enough that it actually penetrates your outer layer of skin. I know I've mentioned this before, but your outer layer of skin is actually dead. It, your body does this naturally to protect itself. It doesn't want to expose live cells to the elements. It would not be good. So, UV radiation comes in. It's so energetic. It, it goes in through your dead layers of skin. It makes it through. A lot of it becomes absorbed. Most of it does. But then it'll hit live cells. And when it does, if your body is receiving too much of that UV radiation, your body will start pumping melanin into your skin if you have the ability to do that. Some of us don't tan, so that doesn't happen. So this is why you're getting a tan. Your body is actually trying to protect itself from UV radiation. If you don't get enough of UV, UV radiation, your skin tends to turn very light colored or get lighter. Now, that really only applies to white people. White people are white because as people had migrated away from the equator, our genes began to favor those of lighter skin because our bodies need to have a small amount of UV radiation to help us process certain vitamins. But too much radiation and you've got skin cancer. So as people got further and further and lived longer times in the northern regions and most southern regions on our planet, the UV radiation actually is less intense there and people needed to absorb more UV radiation. So people got whiter and whiter. Now, people of darker skin tones, UV radiation absorbs rather quickly in the outer layer of skin. So it is actually extraordinarily rare to ever have someone of dark skin color end up having skin cancer because their body just naturally protects them against UV radiation. Now, that's good, 
and great and awesome, but there is a downside. People with darker skin, if they live further away from the equator, like let's say Utah, they tend to be low in certain vitamins and need to take those supplements because they are not allowed, not allowed, but they, they don't break down the vitamins as well. But honestly, if I had to take skin cancer and, and vitamin supplements, like, I mean, it's an easy, obvious choice right there. Is it good or bad? Well, ozone is both. It's awesome because it keeps us from dying and from UV rays from the sun and keeping us from getting skin cancer. So, I mean, that's really good. But when it hangs out in the troposphere, it's not great for us because it's actually a poisonous gas to breathe. So because of this, ozone is considered a pollutant when it exists in the troposphere. Now I'm zooming this out so don't panic, um, but I'm zooming it so you can see it a little bit better. But ozone molecules basically are very highly reactive or oxidizing agents. They like to react with almost anything. And they like to also react with the molecules that make up our respiratory tract. When I say respiratory tract, I mean like your airways, so your nasal cavity, your throat, uh, all the way down into your lungs. So ozone will actually physically, chemically react with the atoms that make up the cell wall. So here we're going to write down ozone chemical reacts with the cells in our airways damaging cells. So this can lead to asthma attacks and this can induce asthma attacks in people who don't typically have asthma. Inflammation and irritation and burning of the lungs and just make it hard to breathe. That says breath, but it should say breathe. So again, like I said, because of all of this, it is considered an air pollutant, but only when it's in the troposphere. You still need to write this. Press pause before I move on. So definition of a pollutant is basically a substance that harms life. And because ozone uh, kills cells, it reacts with the cells, destroying them a little bit at a time. It definitely is a pollutant. We actually use ozone in our water purification processes. So when stuff goes down the drain um, in your sink or down in your, your kitchen or the dishwasher, the washing machine, your toilet, the bathtub, the shower, all that stuff gets collected. And here in Utah, it actually gets sent to a sewage treatment plant. At a sewage treatment plant, they go through and they take all the large solid materials out. They let um, sludge, is actually the technical term for it, settle to the bottom of a tank and they hold all the water still and then they move the clear water on. Well, even after you get all that clear stuff to separate, the water's contaminated with viruses and uh, fungus and bacteria. Well, one of the processes they do is they move the water along to a processing tank, a clarifying tank, where they pump the tank with ozone gas and the ozone because it's so reactive any kind of living organisms that are left in the water will be destroyed and ripped apart as their these one-celled organisms are exposed to the ozone molecule so definitely a pollutant because it definitely harms life even if we want it to harm life and that's a good thing for us because we don't need those biological uh, dangerous things in our, our waterways, um, it's still definitely a pollutant and it hurts us too. Now something that's a bit of a debate is climate change molecule called carbon dioxide. So climate change is real, but there's a lot of debate going back and forth on whether or not carbon dioxide would be considered a pollutant. By the basic definition of something that harms life, it's a maybe. Some people argue that carbon dioxide harms life because it helps retain heat because it's our 
our largest greenhouse gas. And the more we have of it, the more heat it retains, and the more heat it retains, the more climate systems are shifted, and the more things suffer. But it's not really the carbon dioxide that's hurting the organisms, it's instead the heat that's hurting the systems that the carbon dioxide is then retaining. And so it's kind of a hard thing because it's, yeah, it hurts life, but only indirectly and without carbon dioxide, we would have no life that we are used to here on the planet. For example, you are a carbon-based life form. I am a carbon-based life form. Plants, trees, well, trees are plants, but uh, plankton, most plankton are also carbon-based life forms. Plants and a lot of protists take in carbon dioxide. They use it to create their body structure. They use it to create food that they use later when they respire. And they make life possible for everything else that then consumes them and makes that carbon dioxide part of their body too. Of course, it's not carbon dioxide anymore. It's changed into a different, more complex molecule. But without this chemical, life would literally be completely different than we have now on our planet. So you're breathing it out. You're creating it as you breathe in and out all the time. So it doesn't harm you. So whether it's a pollutant or not, I don't know. I guess you have to have the argument of whether or not you believe it's a pollutant. But either way, it definitely is propelling climate change. Anyway, back to ozone. So if you didn't know, there's this sort of catastrophe called the ozone hole. Here it looks kind of like a hole, like an actual peel, but what it more like is is a layer that's not as thick in some areas. So this is Antarctica. We're looking at the South Pole here. Now, in 1970s, we discovered that there was an ozone hole. This is the 1979, the year I was born. So here we have a colors here. They don't represent heat, but instead thickness. So here green is a little bit of a thickness. Uh, we've got orange was a lot of thickness, yellow less thickness, and then we have here uh, very thin, and then here nearly nothing existing. So in 1979 we discovered that not only was there a hole in the ozone, but these non-toxic inert material called CFC or chlorofluorocarbons was actually interacting with an ozone molecule and destroying it. See, now chlorofluorocarbons, we use them in accelerants. Uh, we use them in spray cans. We use them in hairspray cans. We use them in welding procedures and a lot of um, air conditioners. It's an extremely cheap molecule to manufacture. And it was great because you could breathe it in and it didn't harm humans. It doesn't react with anything. And when I say it's inert, it's not reacting with stuff. It's not flammable. And it just kind of bounces off stuff. It's a very stable molecule until it floats up into the atmosphere in the stratosphere above the ozone layer. When this happens, sorry, <laughs> messed around a little bit for a minute there. When this happens, that molecule, this is 1980, gets broken down by the intense UV radiation, the ultraviolet radiation that is no longer being blocked out because now the molecules above the ozone layer. This is 1981. Some countries at this time decided, hey, this thing's destroying our ozone layer. Let's stop using it. And so we've got a thinning of the ozone here. And these CFCs break down, separating the chlorine from the chlorofluorocarbon. And when it does it, this chlorine atom, or we actually call it the chlorine radical, does some catalytic reactions. Where basically, it's used as a catalyst. Catalyst is a chemical in a reaction that doesn't really get used up in a reaction, um, but it kind of works as a piggyback. So basically, you've got this ozone molecule made up of three atoms of oxygen. They're bonded together. And this chlorine goes up and buddies up against that ozone. It frees one of the oxygen atoms and it chemically binds to it, leaving 
uh, the oxygen atom that we breathe and the oxygen sinks down lower into the atmosphere. When it does this, it removes the ozone's ability to absorb UV radiation because it destroys the actual molecule. And then this chlorine attached to an oxygen runs into a free-floating oxygen atom and the oxygen combines, releases the chlorine atom, chlorine radical, and that chlorine radical is now free because it's done with its uh, being a catalyst, and now it's free to destroy another ozone molecule. So it goes over to another ozone molecule and starts that whole process over again. Now, it takes an estimated 80 years for this chlorine, or halogens, which is, chlorine is a type of uh, um, molecule or atom, uh, to get out of the atmosphere, to rain out of the atmosphere and come back down to the earth. 80 years. So while we have this hole forming, and most countries have stopped using chlorofluorocarbons, we still have this chlorine atom floating around in the atmosphere. So this is 1981. If we go over here, this here is 2000. This here is 2002. This is the hole in, oh my goodness, 2006, and then even if we jump forward to 2014, the hole's not really repairing itself. I mean, it kind of is. You have these cloudy areas where it's thickening a little bit, but it's it's going to estimate somewhere between 50 and 100 years before all of these molecules get taken out of the atmosphere, even though no one's really using them as much anymore. So this video, oh, sorry, actually we haven't written down the notes for this slide yet jumping ahead of myself. So write this down because this will be one of the questions on the writing prompt today. The ozone hole, CFCs, also known as chlorofluorocarbons, react with the O3 molecule or ozone molecule. And they do this by ripping off an oxygen atom, dismantling the ozone. So what this does is it leaves gaps or holes in the ozone layer where we have very few to no molecules of ozone filtering out that UV radiation. Pause if you need more time. Right, so this video is a really good educational video. It talks about this whole process, this chemical breakdown of the ozone, why it happens, but it also talks about how we came together as an entire planet, countries, people of different nations decided that we needed to fix this problem that we had created. So many nations came together and by 1987, I think, the Montreal Protocol was signed, which countries, different nations vowed to stop using these harmful chemicals that are destroying the ozone layer. All right, so it's going to be about 17 minutes. Try not to fall asleep um, and listen to the video. I have heard of a world where we live in the shadows, undercover, constantly in hiding. A world where we seek shelter from the sun, the very same sun without which life on earth would not exist. A world where we are unceasingly seeking protection for our skin, our eyes. Where skin cancer spreads, the human immune system weakens, marine life slowly perishes, livestock is damaged, plants and crops deteriorate. Thankfully, our Earth has a natural shield to protect it from such a scenario. That shield is the ozone layer. It extends over the entire globe, high up in the atmosphere. It filters the sun's ultraviolet radiation, a carefully balanced act. Researchers discovered in the mid-1970s that apparently our refrigerators, air conditioners, aerosol cans, firefighting equipment, and some solvents and pesticides could potentially damage the ozone layer. Shortly after that, the extent of the damage was revealed. It was happening over Antarctica, a discovery that would trigger unprecedented global action for the protection of our environment.
that was over 25 years ago. How does a hole just appear in the atmosphere? I've decided to find out for myself. My search for answers will lead me to the scientists closest to the issue, who discovered the hole, and those who've been studying it ever since. First stop, Cambridge in the UK. The British Antarctic Survey has been monitoring ozone levels since the 1950s. Jonathan Shanklin was one of the first to notice that something wasn't right. When we made our discovery, ozone had then been monitored from the Antarctic for nearly 30 years, that we had a whole stack of handwritten sheets where the basic numbers from the instrument had been written down, but they hadn't been processed to give the ozone amount. And so as a young graduate, I was given the task of supervising all this and coming up with the, the answers. What I did was plot out the, the lowest 11-day running mean value each Antarctic spring. Ozone levels seemed to be falling off the charts. And at that point, the other members of the team, Joe Farman and Brian Gardner, came up with a paper that was published in Nature and showed something really strange was going on over Antarctica. The ground measurements showed that every year, the spring total ozone levels would dramatically fall over Antarctica. As my travels lead me to NASA's Gadar Space Flight Center, I learned that this disturbing trend was also being confirmed by observations from above. It was shortly after that that the first pictures of the Antarctic ozone hole came out from the satellite data. Remember that uh, a ground station just looks up and sees one spot on the Earth. But the satellite gives you a global picture of total ozone, and that's where the name ozone hole comes from. It looked like a, a hole had been punched through the ozone layer. In retrospect, that was a really good thing to call it, because an ozone hole must be bad. Almost automatically, it meant that people wanted something doing about it. The hole had to be filled in. Ozone has a natural regulation process, but something was throwing it off balance. Our use of certain chemicals, most notably chlorofluorocarbons and halons. Chlorofluorocarbon is a, is a very non-reactive gas. It, you can breathe it um, and it doesn't affect you at all. But when you release this gas, it gets fairly well mixed in the lower atmosphere and then it leaks into the stratosphere. And these chlorofluorocarbons get above the ozone layer, actually. So they get broken down by that intense solar radiation that's sort of beyond the ozone layer. Now, once they do that, they free a chlorine atom. And the chlorine atom engages in a little catalytic reaction. It will react with ozone, and then it will react with another oxygen atom to regenerate itself back to chlorine. So one chlorine molecule in a little cycle can destroy thousands of ozone molecules. If ozone-depleting chemicals were being released all around the world, why was there so much chemical destruction of ozone happening over Antarctica? During winter, the stratosphere in the polar region is very cold, and so temperature can reach about minus 80 degrees. And in these conditions, clouds are formed. They are called the polar stratospheric clouds. And on the surface of these clouds, there are chemical reactions that convert chlorine compounds to very efficient compounds. So the air cools. As it cools, it sinks. And as it sinks, it begins to spin. And this sets up what's called the polar vortex, stopping exchange with the outside and turning the center of Antarctica into a giant cooking pot where all the chemistry takes place that destroys the ozone. We certainly thought that the discovery would shake a, a, a lot of groups up. It's being called an unprecedented display of international cooperation to protect the world's environment. The Montreal Protocol, signed today, aims at stopping the deterioration of the ozone layer in the atmosphere. The Montreal Protocol was really a, a landmark agreement, and it really required um, a scientific foundation, that is, you had to have solid science that formed the basis of the Montreal Protocol. And then that fed upward to um, policymakers, government policymakers, politicians, um, industry people, technologists. Um, how, if you got rid of chlorofluorocarbons, how did you substitute for those chlorofluorocarbons? All those groups came together, and in 1987, 
um, they negotiated the Montreal Protocol. It's quite amazing that every single one of the UN member states has signed up to the treaty and is working. By the uh, mid-1990s, the production in developed countries of these ozone uh, depleting substances had been largely stopped. And now, even in developing countries, chlorofluorocarbons are no longer produced. In their place, transitional substitutes have been introduced, these being revised periodically following scientific and technological assessments. Many groups around the world have been following the protocol's success, amongst them the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in Boulder, Colorado. You can very clearly see in the measurements that the actions of the Montreal Protocol have reduced the emissions of ODSs and also you can actually see the change in the concentration of ODSs in the lower atmosphere as well as in the stratosphere. The ozone layer now has stabilized. It doesn't uh, decrease anymore, but we are still waiting for the abundance of ozone to increase to previous uh, level. So we still have to enforce the Montreal Protocol, uh, mainly because of uh, the very large lifetime of these gases. We did a study here in which we looked at um, what would have happened if if chlorofluorocarbons just kept increasing steadily with time. So, as we went from 1960 into the future, chlorine was going up and up and up. Now, what if chlorine wasn't regulated? That the Montreal Protocol did not occur, chlorine would have kept going up, and ozone would have kept heading down and down and down. And so by the time you got out here to 2065, two thirds of the ozone layer is gone. Now, what that means is it means a couple of things. First of all, because you have no ozone above you, you have lots of the solar ultraviolet radiation that can penetrate to the Earth's surface. You get sunburned very fast and very severe sunburns in some cases. Skin cancer cases would go up. Cataracts, eye cataracts would increase. And as crops failed, crop prices would increase. This would probably lead to political instability. There would have been many, many unfortunate effects of large ozone depletion. And so the Montreal Protocol has had a dramatic effect on saving us from that world. We think that the chlorofluorocarbons would be decreased to sufficiently low level that the ozone hole would be disappearing towards the end of this century. We need to take care of our atmosphere and the Montreal Protocol shows us the way to go. This is something that is working. And equally amazingly, the Montreal Protocol has done a huge amount to combat, combat climate change. Ozone depleting substances like chlorofluorocarbons are also powerful greenhouse gases. So what that means is that when we regulated chlorofluorocarbons, ozone depleting substances, you had a dual benefit. You benefited not only the ozone layer, but you benefited climate. We're now going to add into the atmosphere, we're gonna use as replacements, gases that have as much climate change or more than the CFCs. They're called hydrofluorocarbons. And so if you wanted to um, uh, do some action on climate change through the Montreal Protocol, you could consider uh, the replacement with new technologies or less climate active gases um, rather than the, the gases we're currently looking at. An increase in our emissions of greenhouse gases has been warming the surface of the planet and lower atmosphere. Changes in temperature, wind circulations, and chemicals found in the atmosphere will affect the future of the ozone layer in many different ways, ways that are at this time still very difficult to forecast. Climate is going to change the stratosphere and change ozone levels because of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. So these are not 
ozone depleting substances that are regulated under the Montreal Protocol. Initially, one of our worries about um, the ozone hole was that climate change, the increased amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, warming the surface of the planet, but cooling the ozone layer. So it has an influence uh, on the formation of polar stratospheric clouds, and this will delay ozone recovery in that region. More recently, we found that the ozone hole itself is interacting with the climate. We are now recognizing that, in fact, changes in the stratosphere, changes of ozone, can have an effect on surface climate, something that wasn't really well recognized uh, 10, 20 years ago. When people started worrying about ozone depletion, they were concerned about things like skin cancer primarily and ultraviolet rays. And um, in the last uh, several years, you know, it became clear that you know, the ozone depletion impacts very strongly uh, the circulation, the winds, you know, the flow in the atmosphere. This is the Earth, it's the equator, the North Pole, this is the South Pole. If you have an ozone hole and the ozone isn't there anymore, then locally you have a cooling now because you're not absorbing the rays and so you're colder than you would be if the ozone were there. And as a consequence of, of that cooling, the winds react. And a very simple and manifest way in which they react is that the storm tracks have been moving forward. And together with that, the precipitation and the desertic region are all moving towards the pole. Ozone recovering will, will be a, a major component of climate changes in the coming decades and it has to be accounted for. And it seems to me that, therefore, any discussion having to do with um, greenhouse gases cannot be had without, at the same time, discussing um, ozone recovery. Because we now know of these feedbacks between the ozone hole and climate, and climate and the ozone hole, the provisions of the Montreal Protocol do allow regulation of any gases that may affect the ozone layer. And because there is such widespread agreement that the protocol is a good treaty that is working and that all countries can um, sign up for, maybe that is the way that we can go in the future. Montreal Protocol started off with what I would call baby steps. They took a decision and based on science, they changed the decision a few years later, again a few years later. So there are a lot of amendments and adjustments which finally became so successful. There may be a lesson in that for the climate negotiations and climate decisions also. The Montreal Protocol, I believe this, and it's a, this is an opinion, um, is a great, it's a great example of what can be accomplished if nations, industry, technologists and scientists all combine to work on a problem. I, I think it would be um, incorrect to say that because the ozone hole is closing, the ozone story is finished. We have half a century or more to see what, what is going to happen, you know, as a consequence of the Montreal Protocol, in fact. And we expect things to be both interesting scientifically, but also practically um, uh, challenging, you know. So we'll see what happens. So it seems that, as a result of the Montreal Protocol, the ozone hole is on its way to recovery. But our atmosphere is constantly changing, making it difficult to predict exactly how things will evolve. But in the end, I have learned we have a huge role to play. Because we may have the power to destroy the atmosphere, but through global action, we also have the ability to work together internationally to repair the damage we have wreaked and protect the planet for generations to come.
All right, so we're going to write down a few effects of having an ozone hole. First one is a cataracts. Now, cataracts is basically the cloudiness of the eye, and this happens through the eye's interaction with UV radiation. So it's very good to have sunglasses when you're outside, even if you're not staring at the sun like, you know, we did, like half of us did when we were little, and we just stared at the sun to see how long we could stare at it like idiots. Um, that actually affects your eye. Now, luckily, this actually is affecting the outside of the eye, so this can be surgically removed. It couldn't always be surgically removed, but we can fix this now. And you probably have seen this. This is a kind of a rare type that looks almost like little crystals, but usually it's just a cloudiness of the eye. Light goes in and it, it refracts and it makes it really hard to see. Um, you've probably seen this on older dogs. For some reason, dogs seem to get this a lot quicker. Maybe they're idiots like us and stare into the sun for no reason whatsoever while they're outside, or maybe they're just more susceptible to it. I bet the second one. Um, also, you can see this in old cats as well. But what happens is it just changes the chemical makeup of the outer layer of your eye, causing this cloudiness. Now, skin cancer also, and in fact, all of these effects is just increased UV radiation. That's what all this is. So skin cancer increases crop failures. Um, so usually not the entire crop, but it will burn the leaves because, again, it's UV radiation. Anything with DNA is going to be affected. Reducing the uh, planktons in the ocean. Remember, plankton is responsible for 54% of the world's oxygen. They produce a lot more than trees produce in way of oxygen. And they're also the base of the food chain or the food web for the entire, entirety of the ocean. So all of the ocean um, life depends on this base, this these plankton. And now more effects is skin burns on aquatic organisms. So even the water is not protecting them when we don't have um, ozone. This is typically by the Antarctic Circle and lower. Um, suppresses the immune system as well, so we get sick more often. Now, you might not know what the immune system is. You might have forgotten from seventh grade. But the immune system basically helps you get better. You might think that you go and get some Sudafed or you get some NyQuil and that's what makes you better. That just makes you feel a little better because it eases some of your symptoms. But your immune system is actually what heals you. Your body will sense and detect bad things in your body, like fungus and viruses and bacteria. And when it detects these, it sends out these special white blood cells to notify the whole body. And then those cells send out T cells, and they attack them, and they destroy the sickness inside your body. Well. When you are affected with more UV radiation, your body's immune system is actually suppressed. So there are fewer of these white blood cells. There's fewer T cells going out and attacking things. So you can get sicker quicker because you, the disease can multiply inside of you, damaging more of your cells, making you ill. So not only get more sick more often, but sicker when you're sick. All right, so the next step is you guys are going to read chapter 11, section 3. We already read section 1 and 2 of this chapter. It's only about two or three actual full pages, um, but it has some good reading, help us to have some deeper understanding. All right, so everybody's going to need a computer. Go to mrsgrether.org, go to the textbook link, chapter 11, section 3. After that, we will go to the ozone writing prompt. All right, so to show you guys, again, you go to Mrs. No, don't go there. Don't go there. Mrs. Grether dot org. Go to textbooks. Or science textbook. Scroll down to chapter 11, seasons and ozone. Scroll to the bottom. And go all the way past seasons to section Three. All right, now you guys can choose to read this uh, orally as a class, or you can choose to read it individually. We'll need about 15 minutes or so for the writing prompt, so uh, make sure you choose your, your time wisely.